good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Strongkreit. I'm one of the founders of a small nonprofit called Democracy in Practice. We're dedicated to democratic experimentation, innovation, and capacity building in educational content. Um, and so for us, reinventing civics means reinventing student government. Uh, just to get a sense, raise your hand, please, if you are generally familiar with the idea of a student government or a student council. Pretty much everybody, all right. Anybody not familiar with that concept? Good, that saves some time. Um, so, so uh, student government is kind of founded on this beautiful idea that students should be able to come together and have meetings, deliberate, make decisions on behalf of the student body, uh, that they should be able to have first-hand experience with the challenges and the joys of leading and governing. And uh, you see this play out even, even if the, the project they're working on is simply the, the planning of a you know, dance at the end of the school year. Um, and listening to these presentations with Frank and with Sean, what they're doing in the classroom, Nicole, what she's found with the, the data there, um, it's, it's incredible if you can go really deep into action civics into these project-based planning, but even if it's a, a more limited project, it can be a real deep, uh, a rich learning experience. We have been working in Bolivia, of all places. Uh, student government there is basically the same as student government in my high school in New York and schools around the world. Uh, and the students that we've worked with, they were given the right encouragement and support, and so they've been able to dig into some, some really awesome things. Uh, let's try this out. So for example, this is a night high school. Students work during the day, they go to school at nighttime. Uh, the older students usually, the school never had a library. So the student government decided to establish the school's first library. And since they got the books and the book stands and they acquired the computer and they registered everything, they got to decide the, the rules, the hours, they had to staff the library um, and check out the books and, and be responsible for all of that. It was actually in their office, which they run with the padlock and combination, and nobody else knows the combination. Um, here's the inauguration of the school one night. Uh, you have teachers seeing this for the first time. And uh, as you can imagine, they were pretty pleased the first time that the teacher wanted to take a DVD to show from the library to show to their class. I was heading towards the door. And they got to say, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, if you want to take that DVD, you just need to show some ID first. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so they, they enjoyed that. We've also seen uh, students on their own initiative going to meeting with, uh, getting meetings with the mayors of the towns or city councils to talk about issues with school lunch. Um, we have seen, let's see, reforestation projects. Um, we've also seen uh, successful attempts to denounce one alleged case of teacher abuse of power. So this is the, the principal of the school, the student government uh, meeting to make a formal complaint about that that was taken very seriously. Um, and they also do a lot of fun stuff too. So this is a, this is a rural school, it's K through eight. The student government said they wanted to do a bicycle competition on a weekend. Uh, and uh, kind of un, uh, unknown to a lot of the teachers, they, they wrote up a formal letter, they signed, stamped and everything. They took it to the local police station so that when they ran this race, even though they're out in the middle of you know, this countryside, there's absolutely no traffic on this road other than occasional pack mule. Um, when they ran the race, they had a full police escort uh, <laughs> taking, taking them around. Um, so as you can imagine, engaging these types of projects, as has been said by the, you know, Nicole and Sean and Frank, uh, it's, it's a really beautiful thing for them. You know, you're talking about facilitating your own know, meetings, and setting agendas, and taking notes. You're talking about managing money and uh, executing projects. And so I don't think I need to explain to you the, the immense potential that student government has for uh, civic learning and leadership development. Unfortunately, uh, I feel like this potential is being really held back. And uh, there's, there's several reasons for that. One big one is a lack of adequate support for student governments. Uh, and Frankly, until the day that the people who decide on curriculum decisions and, and educational policy prioritize civic education and leadership development the way that they do math and science and, and music, um, it's really going to come down to whether your school has teachers and administrators that want to go that extra mile with student government or not. And, and we've been trying to push that a little bit, but as a small organization, there's only so much we can do. A different big problem that we realized that we could try and fix um, is the way student government operates. So a big problem with this is that this beautiful experience uh, is not open to everyone. And in fact, it's closed to the vast majority of students in most schools. 
Uh, not officially, but it takes a certain amount of confidence, charisma, and popularity to win a student election, to make it into student government. And so uh, you notice the same types of students cycle in student government year in, year out, and it's usually not the 21% of actively disengaged students. Um, and there's, there's a lot of students that are even just terrified of running as a candidate, or want nothing to do with running as a candidate, and let alone uh, trying to win a competitive election. Um, and so shyer and less popular students in practice often are excluded year after year. And this is patently unfair, but it, it also has the added problem of kind of teaching young people this flawed notion that there are a few hero leaders out there, and that the rest of them Democracy means simply casting a vote every once in a while and usually forgetting about it until the next year. Um, and we saw this, when we were talking with students, we went into a new school and most of the classrooms, we would ask them, who here has a right to learn about leadership, learn to be a leader? And they would all say, oh, we all do. But there was one classroom in that school where we said that, they just kind of looked around and they said, Pamela, Pamela's got the right. And she was the class president the previous year. And so it's just like, uh, you know, those questions where there's no wrong answer, to me that was a wrong answer, and we had a good discussion around that. So, challenging those notions. This is a big, big problem, and one that most people aren't aware of. It's just kind of not thought about. It's like, oh, well, student elections, uh, you know, that's the way it's got to be, so. And the question is, how can we solve this problem? And it turns out that there's a solution that is simple, it's dirt cheap, and it's quite Efficient. <laughs> <laughs> and what I mean by efficient, I mean that it takes less time for teachers than traditional student elections. And that solution is to replace traditional elections with voluntary lotteries. Right? And so the idea is that any student who wants to participate can line up, enter the lottery, and have an equal opportunity. And this solves the problem of inclusion, exclusion, obviously, because lotteries really don't care how popular you are, they don't care how charismatic you are. They don't care how ambitious you are. And so it really evens the, the playing field for everyone. Uh, this is, well, uh, I'll give you a sense. Oh, so as far as being simple, we have fourth and fifth graders that run the lotteries themselves in front of the whole school. As far as being cheap, you can do this with pretty much anything you have on hand. There's also a lot of free apps. Um, in, in the rural school that I mentioned there, they use different colored fava beans, um, dried fava beans clay cooking pot and uh, traditional cloth. And so they would put the different colored beans in the, the pot, people would line up, they go one by one. Uh, they reach into the pot and you pull out a bean. And if it's green, it's not your lucky day, but uh, if it's purple, you, you get to enter the student government. And uh, it's not a new concept by any means to use lotteries to select representatives. Right? So this is a big thing 2,000 plus years ago in ancient Athens. Also a central part of citizens' juries and many publics have been talked about a lot at this conference. Um, I want to talk about some of the advantages of, of using lotteries in the educational context. So advantages of student government lotteries. First one, as I've mentioned, equal educational opportunities for all when it comes to student government. Uh, so I'm not going to belabor that point, but it also increases interest and enthusiasm when it comes to student government. I know there's a lot of students, I was one of them, didn't really want much to do with student government saw it in a certain way because there's always certain types of students in, in involved and, uh, and so it kind of disengaged. But we went to one school the previous year in the student elections, there was a handful of students that ran for student council. And the first year when we implemented lotteries, it was 230 uh, students, which was half of the school, that entered the lotteries and said they wanted to be in the student council. So you change the way of selecting and all of a sudden there's a lot more students that want to participate. Another advantage is that you increase the diversity and representativeness of the student council or the student government. Obviously because you're letting in different types of students, shy, less popular students, students from different social circles that often are not part of student government. And I was talking with the president of a university in Ohio and he told me that, I was not aware, some colleges around the country are talking about disbanding the student organization on their campus and the student government on their campus because of a continued frustration that it doesn't look like the broader student body, it doesn't seem to represent the broader student body. And he was much more keen on just getting rid of elections than getting rid of student politics altogether. And you can solve some of those problems when you use things like lotteries and stratified sampling. One thing I forgot to mention, when we do this, even fourth and fifth graders can do it in a way which you ensure even gender representation in the student government, and you ensure a representation of the different grade levels. It's pretty simple, you just separate the lotteries. 
Um, so that's another big advantage. And when you when you allow different students to participate, you also broaden the concept of leadership. Right? So if different types of students are allowed to assume leadership positions, they start to recognize that there are indeed different types of leaderships. And leadership is not just the domain of the most charismatic and confident, outspoken people. Right? Another advantage that really surprised me, actually, I wasn't thinking about this, I'm all into lotteries and stratified samplings. They're really into the friendships that come out of this experience. right? Uh, and it's, it's, when you think about it, oftentimes student governments, it's a, it's a group of friends that already knew each other, a clique that organizes a party, and they run together, and they win, and then they're in. This is 10 or 12 complete strangers from different grades, different genders, different social circles. They come together and start to work together, and they find they really like those varied friendships, because it's much more interesting than what they find in their own social circles. Oh, I forgot I had a picture. Just that. So <laughs> this is a group of 12 students, uh, might have lost one along the way, um, finishing their term of office together. Another advantage is that lotteries are just more fun than elections. And we find this across the board. Teachers like it more, students like it more. I can try and explain that part, but video is more useful. Now, I don't know how does video work with clicker. Frank, can you, you may have to. What do you need? Let's see. Uh, just take that. Out of the presentation. Let's, this one, yeah, just. Oh, there, there it is. Yeah, right there. so I'll just click down. All right, so usually the first lottery, we'll have students administer it, or any teachers. And then afterwards, we actually do shorter terms of office, you get more students involved. So outgoing students will administer the, the, the next lottery. <laughs> <laughs> he took so long to pick a bean that the light went off. <laughs> she actually got selected. Some, some students will enter and they're not quite sure if they want, they want to get picked. Uh, and she had a good term of office. And one of the reasons it's more fun is because it's a game, but it's not a competitive game. So no, everybody can play, and nobody has to worry about getting publicly rejected by the entire school that day. Right? So, so they can just enjoy that. And we also uh, they have a lot of smaller lotteries inside the student government. So you, you take this idea and you apply it at different levels. And uh, everybody who wants to participate in the student government has an equal chance, so we use lotteries. And then once you're in the student government, Everybody who wants to learn different aspects of student government, like being a spokesperson or a treasurer or taking notes, should have an equal opportunity. So they randomize that as well. And the students, uh, so which slide we have now? The students have come up with some of their own, they, they really like to get into this, so go ahead and hit play. Some of their own ways to, uh, to randomly select between the volunteers within the student government. So you got rock, paper, scissors is a popular one. This is a game that they, they call Fu Man 2. I don't know why, but it's for like three or four people. Spin the bottle, always popular with teenagers. <laughs> he won't get kissed. He actually has to take notes that meeting. Um, names in a hat. And they really grab a hold of this idea. This is actually a lottery for something that nobody wanted to do. right? So when you have no volunteers, instead of just putting out somebody, say, all right, everybody, uh, we're going to enter a lottery, and somebody's going to get picked. So you'll see the relief on her face when but it wasn't her, right? <laughs> and unfortunately, somebody ended up having it. I think it was transcribing a letter they had wrote. Or so it's something that they really grab a hold of. Um, even, uh, I mean, just, just a basic sense of fairness. Right? Um, and it avoids a lot of awkward conversations in small groups when, like, a couple people want to be the treasurer, and the whole group picks one, and another person feels pretty small after. So those are some of the advantages of lotteries. I hope by now I've uh, convinced you that it's at least worth considering uh, instead of elections in an educational context. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how this might connect with you all and what you're passionate about. Uh, so uh, we had a brief introduction. Some new people have come in. I'd like you to raise your hand if you are an educator in uh, elementary, high school, college. All right. So um, actually I might commandeer the computer real quick. So I just want to show you, we have a, a website up that has all sorts of different resources. They're all free, open source resources. We have uh, kind of in-depth PDF guides that uh, explain how to do lot the lotteries. 
Um, we also currently have a lot of videos in Spanish um, of students explaining to other students how they do different aspects of student government. Because uh, we have other things that we implement, rotation, horizontal teams, they rotate, facilitate meetings, and so there's all that there so that uh, students can learn that directly. Uh, and when I get a chance, I'll be putting up English versions with subtitles, or if anybody's keen to volunteer, see me afterwards, that'd be awesome. Um, so encourage you all, yeah, we can do it. That's a great idea, great idea, all right. So um, I encourage you all to check out our website, Democracy in Practice, if you just search that in Google, I have business cards. Uh, I knew that you all be taking about a kilo of materials uh, from, uh, from Frank, so I just, um, but democracy in practice, um, and to really think about ways that you might be able to incorporate at least some of these things. You can go as deep as you want to, but, uh, um, and, and if there's somebody else in your educational institution that might champion this idea, please let them know, um, and, and I'll be free to get in, get in touch with us. So, um, PB people, raise your hand if you're involved in just a Story budgeting in some way. It could be inside the classroom, outside the classroom. So um, I was talking with Cindy Terceros uh, after the tour at Central High, and she mentioned that they actually encourage schools to not let the student government plan the PB, right? because they didn't want the usual suspects, the same, often high achieving students, they get a lot of opportunity to participate like that. She mentioned that they still oftentimes get the same types of students because it's either nominated by teachers or there's another election, so it's not the students in the student government, but it looks often like... Or self-selected. Or self-selected. And so she really liked the idea of a lottery to get that group that's going to then, you know, volunteers, and then if everybody can't do it at the same time, then, then you randomize it. So I uh, encourage you all to think about that in school context, out of school context, participatory budgeting. There is some, some concerns about self-selection as meaning that those who participate in PB might not be representing all populations the same way. And so uh, we have some colleagues out in Australia, the New Democracy Foundation, uh, that have done randomly selected groups, kind of like citizens' juries, but they do participatory budgeting in the city of Melbourne. That's something to think about. Um, let's see, people from funding organizations that do grants, that type of thing. Raise your hands. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> We'd really like to hear from you afterwards. <laughs> we can find ways to collaborate. Um, and, and, and everybody else would just really like to think about these ideas and how they connect with democracy. This is not just for an educational context. Uh, there's actually a growing global movement of groups that are using, say, lotteries and other types of innovations in innovative ways. You can find a map on our website. It's an interactive map. You can find out different organizations and the like. And think about ways to combine things. I've heard a lot of conceptions that's like, I could do PB, or I could do citizens' juries, or, or many publics, but there's all sorts of creative ways that you can combine different elements. Um, and so, think outside the ballot box and get real creative. And uh, excited to write this open. Into the Can you just uh, go back to the original and we'll just come back to it. Quick slides. Um, okay, full on Q&A, it's open, yes. Quick question for verification. Do sure. uh, uh, you want to slide around? Yeah, yeah maybe. Go ahead. Just a quick question for, for clarification for Adam. Uh, to be uh, in the lottery, Students need to volunteer to be in student government or any student they could be included in the lottery? But they have first to be volunteer to be willing to serve the yeah. student government. Good question. So typically it's volunteer. Um, we've also, we're in our fifth year in several different schools, we encourage students to think about experimenting different structures, right? So that they can think about different ways to improve the structure of the student government. And at the Knight High School, they originally decided they wanted to be mentor participation. Everybody should take a turn and serve the school community. They quickly found out there was no way to enforce that in a school that has just incredibly fluctuating attendance and that type of thing. So uh, they shifted towards voluntary, and that's typically worked much better. Um, yeah, but my point is, because they volunteered to win the lottery, yeah. you expand the circle of usual suspects, but still usual suspects. Still, yeah. You don't get the whole the unengaged, the disengaged students uh, yet. Definitely, definitely agree. It's a, it's a step in the right direction, but it's not totally, total democracy yet. Definitely, definitely. Um, the, the one good thing is you have schools where it's half the school. At the rural school, it was literally every student that was eligible would enter every lobby that they could. You couldn't do it twice a year, but, um, and so it depends also on how it's framed, but you can find ways to get those actively disengaged students. And we've had some of our 
standouts in student government have been people that are students that teachers came up and labeled as like problem students that failed years. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that they really like action civics uh, much more than worksheets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone have questions or comments? What are some of the challenges that you get to this, the, just the concept in general of lotteries for leadership? Well, one challenge is that, like, okay, uh, shouldn't they be learning how adult government works? And that's a common challenge. And, and uh, Frank mentioned simulating government as one of them. Um, and to that, we would say there's a lot of other places that people are going to learn how adult government works as they grow up. Um, and I don't know that many of us are like confused watching electoral college and we think like, oh, my student government, you know. Like, I got <laughs> um, and, and, it, and it doesn't seem to be worth excluding a vast majority. What, what, what students need is the civic and citizenship skills and leadership skills. Uh, they can figure out the three branches, and, you know, and they usually get that in a in civics class. Well, and if I can chime in with that as well, it's also just about access, getting them in. So once they're in, I mean, yes, it's not the way that we do this thing, but once I'm in, it, then I can learn about what it is, you know, to do meetings and things like that and kind of deal with, you know, the power structure and everything else. So I see that as a great means, you know, to that too. Yeah, the other one is that they don't know about elections. They don't know yeah. the elections, the electoral system. But, yeah. but yeah. They, they see it everywhere. And, and it also plans to see that, like, well, if something's not working, maybe we can think of creative ways to solve it. Because I don't know that we're all enamored with the political system that we have in as adults. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry, you were next. I'm sorry. Um, I have a question for you. So um, I'm currently like uh, speaking from like student government. I'm actually involved in student government. I'm president of student government in my high school. So I would like to like say I completely like agree with the fact that sometimes the elections when you're the way we run is that um, students who volunteer to like run for like either president, treasurer, secretary. Um, they decide to run, and most of these people who run, they're like known in the school, or they're like popular in school, or it's because like people like them. So I totally agree on that. Like some people do pick like people who are more popular in schools. But then my question is, what do you, don't you think lotteries would kind of like deflect um, students from actually, like when they get out in the actual real world of like adult life and voting, do you think lotteries deflect them from how government actually runs the United States. So I know democracy, of course, is not based on like lottery and people like, let's say, our, um, our past election, um, people just, either one of them picking and then they're the president. Do you think like it deflects them from the actual democracy world where they know, like they think that they can, you know, have the choice to like run for like president and then win by lottery. Do you think like it deflects them from that? I think it's a good question. Um, I, I personally am not too worried about that because, like I said, I think it's more important that they're engaged and they're developing the type of skills they need to be effective citizens and to be effective leaders. Um, and that they could probably pretty quickly, if you've got an engaged uh, student that has, that has met with city councilors, uh, you know, while they're in the student government that has facilitated meetings, they'll probably be able to figure out pretty quickly when they're an adult, okay, what do I need to do to run for local office, right? right. Um, and so, I'm, I'm more worried about these massive portions of student populations that just cycle all the way through school and you know learn about the three branches, but never actually get to have firsthand uh, you know experience leading and seeing themselves as a leader and getting interested in that. Great question. All right, we have to break, and if folks want to go, um, don't forget all of Frank's paperwork. But if you would like, but if you would like to stay and chat, the, the panel can hang around for a little longer. But I want to break for those who, who need to go.